Welcome back to the Deliberate Leaders Podcast. I am your host, Allison Dunn, where we're dedicated to helping leaders build strong, thriving businesses. Um, each episode, we feature inspiring interviews to help you on your leadership journey. And today's guest is no exception. Uh, here in the studio today via Zoom, we have Jeffrey Hall. He is the author of the best selling book, Flex The Art and Science of Leadership in a Changing World. Jeffrey has over 20 years of experience working with executives on issues of high performance leadership and organizational strategy. He is also an educator at Harvard Medical School and New York University, where he has had a front row seat to the rise of the new kind of leader. Jeffrey has identified six elements that leaders in this new workplace need to succeed. Jeffrey, thank you so much for joining us here today. I'm really looking forward to diving into this topic deeper with you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Um, before we get into um, the main topic uh, today about the six elements, I do, I like to kick these off with a quick deliberate conversation. Okay. Um, and so my question for you is what would be your number one leadership tip that you would give to our listeners today? Number one leadership tip would be to look for all the other leaders that you are surrounded by and find ways to level them up to the next level of their own leadership. Awesome, meaning uh, from, a, from a collaborative standpoint or bringing them up with you to rise them up? All of the above. All of the above. I, th I think my core tip is no longer think about leadership as a specialized subset of human beings that get to sit in the C-suite. Instead, mm -hmm. think about leadership as something that is inherently possible in every single person that you meet. Mm. That's a fantastic tip uh, because I do, everyone has it, right? So if you shine it on them, they'll demonstrate it more and more and build strength in that area and confidence. Right. That's awesome. Absolutely. Thank you. So uh, my first question to kick this off is, um, what are some of the new models that you're seeing today in our changing um, workplace? Well, and when you say models, are you mean leadership models or organizational models or? Yes, leadership models. Leadership models. Well, I think the, the biggest shift is from a pyramid hierarchical model to a whole bunch of varying configurations, collaborative partnership models, um, holocratic models, which are kind of, uh, uh, it's a fancy way of creating more of a project management um, structure that's driven more by the task than by the hierarchy and by the talent than by the seniority. Um, there's also networked configurations where people really work more in virtual ongoing networks. Um, so there's a whole range. Um, the bottom line though, mm -hmm. is that I think that today's organizations are moving away from the traditional archetype of the pyramid. And ultimately, I think that's a good thing. What are some of the um, biggest opportunities do you see in, um, in helping leaders shift into what seems to be more of like a remote or hybrid type of workplace model that's going on right now? Well, I think that the, the, the key to successful teaming and leadership in a virtual space or a hybrid space that many organizations will eventually get to, I think, is that some of the same things that worked in the real world when we were all in the same space are equally important in the virtual space, but they have to be done intentionally. You can't just uh, casually meet by the water cooler anymore. Right. You can't just step out of your office and walk down the hall and tap on someone's shoulder um, so the same kinds of activities and, and that create social cohesion, that create a sense of psychological safety, that create a sense of teamwork, all of those things are the same, but they have to be done intentionally. 
So when you're in a virtual space, you really have to, as a leader, you have to think about what am I doing to create the connective tissue that will, or the connective network that will make my people work in their most optimal way. And so you have to really take the levers of, you know, communication and presence, visual opportunities to be right. together, and you have to make the most of them. You have to be really intentional. Whereas we used to be very casual about those things. Now we have to be very intentional. I recognize that it's a, it is definitely like a daily challenge for a lot of um, clients that I work with to make sure that they are making that intentional connection because it's not right. easy anymore. It is right. definitely more difficult for sure. Yeah. And I would say the other big tip that I always give my clients, and you probably find this to be true, is specificity is really important when you're in a, in a virtual space. And by specificity, I mean that it's no longer going to work to just say, so how are you do? How are you today? Uh, what's new? You know, those kinds of vagaries we could get away with when we could read body language or when we had a few extra minutes to have a coffee, because you would say, oh, how are you? And then you would pick up on the signals that maybe somebody wasn't feeling well or they were stressed, and then you could explore. You may not have that luxury in the virtual space. You may not have that time. So you need to have specific questions. I always suggest to my clients, when you're checking in with your people, be very focused. Ask people, what's working? Give me one thing that really helped you ac accomplish that project last week. Or tell me, what is your number one challenge? What is an obstacle that's in the way of your getting your, your, you know, the, the project out the door by next week? So very specific um, questioning. It's kind of interesting because it's the opposite. And in, in one sense, it is the opposite of good coaching because good coaching is when you go out, ask open-ended questions, <laughs> when you explore, right? So, yeah. you know, and I encourage my clients and I'm sure you do too, as a coach to encourage the leaders that we work with to be open-ended and exploring and curious but in a virtual space, it's also very important to be very specific. Otherwise, people will tend to sort of back away and say, oh, I'm fine. Let me turn off my video. And it's like, no, 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 no. We need to know exactly really how are you? Like, tell me the highs. Tell me the lows. Tell me what's working. Tell me what's not working. So that's, some, I think, an important piece of the puzzle. That's a, that's a great tip. Thank you. In, um, in your introduction, I kind of alluded to um, something called the six elements that you've determined to be crucial for leaders um, uh, that they need to have in this new workplace. So can you, could you share any number of them that you're willing to, you know, to kind of outline those for us? Sure, I can give you a quick summary. I mean, basically what, uh, just to give you a little background, in terms of creating this framework that I wrote about in Flex, it was based on two things. First, what I was noticing in my own executive coaching practice over many years of mm -hmm. seeing some of the evolution of the practice, the evolution and change in the types of folks that I was working with, more diversity, more women leaders, more multicultural people of, of different backgrounds. And so as I noticed changes in what I was working, who I was working with and what we were working on, then I did research at the Institute of Coaching at Harvard, where I work part time to find out whether I was kind of the outlier or whether this was actually a, a set of a trends that were happening. And that led me to the result of recognizing that these six dimensions of leadership effectiveness were becoming more and more crucial to the success of leaders in today's world. And just very quickly, you know, there's a whole conversation we could have, but basically flexibility in decision making, intentional communication, like learning how to really connect with others in new ways, emotional intelligence, which I think is a big topic for all of us these days, but, you know, working with the emotions in a way that's effective as a leader, being authentic, which I call realness, which includes competence and strength, but also vulnerability and humility. And then collaboration, you know, different ways to collaborate. Are you an advisor, delegator, director, or are you a coach, mentor, more of a, a consensus builder in your collaborative style? And then finally, engagement. You know, how do you create an environment where you get the best out of everyone? Because ultimately, engagement is about energy. 
creating an environment that has creative energy, where people are motivated, people are inspired, but also people feel safe to be willing to take risks and try out new things. So engagement also for a leader is becoming really crucial if we want to have highly innovative teams in today's competitive env environment. Um, those are awesome elements. I am, um, does, does every leader have a weakness in at least one of those in some way? I mean, I would avoid using the, the term weakness. What I would say mm -hmm. is that all of the leaders that I've worked with have a particular affinity mm -hmm. and maybe a natural strength in a particular part of one of those domains. Um, and then if it becomes so-called a weakness, if it becomes a one trick pony kind of approach to leadership, you know, the goal is really to expand your repertoire. So you start by getting a sense of what you're good at, what your natural strengths are, what you've developed over the period of your experience that has led to your success as a leader, but then begin to recognize that that also has its limitations. A lot of us coaches like to say your greatest strength becomes your greatest liability sure. if you become attached to it at any particular moment. Um, can you give um, me some just highlight tips? So just, I'm going to pick the first one, which I believe was decisiveness, correct? Or decision-making. Yeah, decision-making. Flexible decision-making. Um, yeah. If this is something, um, so what would be some tips for someone to um, hone, hone that in a better way if they're not being decisive enough, compounded by the fact that we're not necessarily together to be able to kind of work through decisions. And so it's on the leader to be more decisive or make a decision. What would be your, some of your coaching tips on that? Yeah, great question. Well, I think it you know starts by recognizing that leadership decision making tends to come in two frames of reference that I think we're all very familiar with. One is very directive, decisive, what I call the alpha style leadership decision maker, right? I'm the boss, I'm at the top of the pyramid and I make the decisions and everybody else follows. The other, which is way at the other end of a spectrum, is I'm a consensus builder. I don't make a decision, it's a group decision. We come together, we brainstorm, and then we democratically vote, or we don't make a decision until we have a consensus. So you can see how they're really two ends of a spectrum. And the tip I would give to anyone who finds themselves on any either end of that spectrum is to recognize that if you are, for example, just the one making all the decisions, then you're probably not getting the best talent out of your group, out of your team, because there may be some really good ideas that you're, you're not listening into. Like, likewise, if in an emergency situation or a really high pressure, urgent decision needs to be made, if you tend to be consensus oriented and sort of wait to get everyone's input, you might miss the boat. You might miss your chance to get a huge deal or to make a decision that will change the organization for the better. So there are times when as the, even the consensus builder needs to step up and be decisive and take the reins. So it's not an either or, but what you do is you start with knowing what is your natural strength and then what do I need to work on? What do I need to expand? How do I need to step into that other space? Certainly to recognize that there's downfalls if you're falling on either, but there's definitely right. benefits to both ends right. as well. Exactly. Um, I um, I talk a lot about impact and in, in the way that we impact as a leader, and I'm just curious if you could share some ideas. You know, like for anyone who really wants to be an inspiring, impactful leader, what do they need to be thinking about right now? Well, I love that because now you're into the second domain of the six that I talked about. So where that really shows up and is in what I call intentional communication. So, you know, you really want to hone in on how do you connect with your team, your customer, your audience, you know, whoever it is you're looking to influence. And again, there tends to be a spectrum. And on one end of the spectrum are those folks, and we're, we know them when we see them, and we know one when we are one, that tend to use the rational argument. Logical, data-driven, a lot of science, a lot of numbers, facts and figures, all of which is great, but it may not connect, it may not influence. Because at the end of the day, human beings make most decisions because of their feelings, because of their emotions. And then there's leaders on the other end of the spectrum 
that are the storytellers that are, you know, telling jokes and connecting with the audience and creating that really good feeling in their communication and influencing. And then they don't get people to make decisions because they're not taken as credible at times. It's like, it's great that you can tell stories, Dr. Hull, but where's your facts and figures, right? So anyone that really wants to be effective in impacting and influencing their, whoever their audience happens to be, needs to be aware of the balance between those two capabilities. Know again, know their strength and then look to expand. Learn to be a storyteller. Learn to use the emotional aspirational elements of storytelling to connect with an audience if you tend to be data-driven and vice versa. If you're a storyteller, I had a scientist who I worked with at a big pharmaceutical company. He was running clinical trials and he was supposed to give an update to his colleagues about what's going on with the medicines and it's very serious research. But he was a incredibly funny joke telling Brit and he got up in front of the audience and he told a bunch of stories about how it was gonna change the world and blah, blah, blah. And at the end of it, you know, his colleagues were like, uh, where's the data? I think you're doing clinical trials. We love listening to you, but credibility, like, hello. So, you know, there are, there's a way in which you maximize both of those key elements to influence and to connect with your audience. And that's really key to what I call intentional communication. Thank you. I think maybe I'm going right down into the third one because my next question <laughs> um, is um, how do you, um, how can an organization cultivate authentic leadership or authentic authenticity within their leaders? Well, well yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think the core of authenticity is building trust. And it helps if people recognize that trust is something that is, uh, you know, hardwired into our neuroscience um, connectivity tissues. And in other words, you can pick up on whether someone's trustworthy within something like a microsecond. Um, and so leaders need to be aware of what it takes to come across with a level of depth and integrity and connection so that people feel grounded that they're getting the truth from folks, from their leaders. And that comes from very simple things, but very powerful things, which is like eye contact and sincere tone of voice and backing up what you're saying with really relevant, credible data and being present with people and not being glib and not um, being dismissive. So there are certain techniques that uh, are really ground us in that ability to feel like we're with someone that we can trust. And I think that if you're going to build trustworthy leaders, as you are asking about, um, it helps if the folks that are um, committed to being trustworthy and to building trusting environments are aware of how trust is built. It's really an emotional core that is based around, you know, our million year old uh, neurocircuitry um, because we have a very, very instantaneous ability as human beings to determine whether or not another human being is trustworthy. Um, we don't talk about trust as a society very often, right. um, even though it's so hardwired in. And I would say like my, I'm, I'm going to call it my trust radar is very strong. So maybe it's, maybe everyone's is. Yeah. The BS detector, <laughs> <laughs> as they say. Um, is, um, so you've given some really good indications on how you can build trust, like the things that just naturally come with someone feeling like you are trustworthy, right? How, how might someone recognize whether, um, some of their, um, retention challenges or their, their team commitment challenges are around trust or not. I feel like as a coach, I get to, as an outsider, see like there's a trust issue here, but I don't know how to get someone else to recognize it? Well, that's a really good question because I think it is difficult sometimes mm -hmm. in a team dynamic to you pick up on subtle cues that people do feel 
either unsafe or that it's not as trusting an environment as we might like, but it's not obvious why. And, you know, I am a huge fan of my friend and colleague, Amy Edmondson's work at Harvard around psychological safety. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that I've used as a tool, and I write about this in my book, and of course she's done tons of research, is to use an assessment that um, gives people an opportunity to anonymously kind of rate the level of trust and safety they feel with, within the team. And whenever I've done that with leaders and their teams, typically what happens is that there's the good news and the bad news. You know, the, the anonymous feedback, if it's set up so that it's anonymous, which can be easily done in, even in a virtual space, a quick assessment, the anonymous feedback usually will say that there's a good sense of trust in certain dimensions. Like we trust the individual, we trust our colleagues, we feel comfortable with our projects, but we're not really willing to take risks or we don't feel safe speaking up because we feel like we might be criticized or we're not really comfortable making a mistake because mistakes are chastised instead of viewed as learning opportunities. So by doing a psychological assessment around safety, you can take a deeper dive into what is it that's gonna take the team to another level of comfort, trust, and safety. And it's very helpful for leaders because they may find that on four out of five or seven out of eight dimensions of psychological safety, everybody's great. But on one, for example, I just recently had a team, a nonprofit executive team I was working with, and they were generally trusting of their leaders and of each other. But there was one dimension, which was they didn't debrief when things didn't go well. They tended to put it under the rug and move on. And that made everybody a little bit uncomfortable if they were going to make a mistake. And so it was great to raise that because then all they had to do is incorporate debriefs. When things don't go well, what we do is we debrief together and we learn what we don't judge, we don't blame. We just figure out what we did that we could do better. And once they started doing that regularly, then everybody kind of relaxed. It's like, we don't have to be perfect. Everyone will make a mistake. This project may not go perfectly but we'll debrief it together and we'll use it as a learning opportunity, not as an opportunity to criticize each other. So, you know, that those kinds of tools can be really helpful to build trust. Okay, so an assessment and then um, getting that anonymous feedback. Yeah, I think that's- uh, You need to let people be able to share their, what they really feel and not feel like they're gonna be um, judged for it. Okay, thank you for that. I'm, uh, so I'm reflecting and feeling as though I feel like the feedback's been given. <laughs> it's been done anonymously. Now, how do you actually transfer the change and building trust? And it, does that go back to some of the, like the key things of good eye contact, you know, like, you know, you know, the emotional connection things. Yeah. yeah, I love, I'm so glad you said that because that is exactly what happened. So I was working, yeah. as I said, with an executive team and the, the CEO or executive director, mm -hmm. He was a little bit dis, dis, uh, disrupted by the fact that his team didn't always feel trusting or safe. And he was like, oh, what do I do? You know, I try my best. And I said, you know what? You have to stop trying to be perfect. It's about being emotionally connected. And so a little bit of humility and a little bit of vulnerability goes a long way. And especially in today's environment where we've all been disrupted we're all trying to deal with this brave new world of virtual work and hybrid. And, you know, I suggest to my leaders that they just be a little more open and transparent that they don't have all the answers. So we have a trust issue. We have a sense of safety issue. Here's what the data shows. Let's work on this together. As a leader, I'm committed to making everyone feel like we can trust each other. So I want your feedback. Let's work on it. And so letting down your hair a little bit and uh, being vulnerable is, um, it's a wonderful opening to create a sense of humanity with your team. It's not always easy for some of the sort of traditional like boomer leaders that uh, have operated with that sense of, oh, oh my God, I have to be competent. I have to be strong. Perfect, but, yeah. But it works. Yeah, okay, awesome. Um, 
Can you um, kind of talk through, I'm going to um, reference it. So what is the importance of the four F's of emotional agility? So the F's. Uh, what were the F's? Feeling. Um, I'm going to forget my four F's. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I should have written them down so that I could prompt you. I'm less prepared than that. Um, <laughs> Um, flexibility, which is obviously core to the theme of my book, right? Developing your agility as a leader to do shifts in behavior and attitude and um, that's required by the context. Um, feelings, which we just talked about, you know, being more emotionally expressive and emotionally available as needed. The third F is focus. And this is really crucial in today's world, which is being able to be present with your people and turning off the phones, turning off the distractions, um, creating a space where you're really 100% with either your folks, your team, or the project that you're working on. Um, and then I think the last F that I like to, maybe it's not the one that's on that chart that you have there, but I always like to include fun. Okay. You know, I, mean, I like fun too. Yeah. People need to have a sense of meaning and connection and joy in their work. It's, it's more important than ever. Yeah. Okay. So uh, flexibility, focus, feelings, and fun. Yeah. I think there's another, those one are there. good. Those are good for, we'll go with. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, um, you uh, you wrote the book Flex and um, what um, and so what is what's the next project that you're working on? What's the big thing that you're focused on? The, you're focused on these days. Um, great that you asked that. I just started a book proposal uh, for the next iteration, and it's really can be summarized by it's sort of to my to my mind the core theme um, that I really wanted to express in Flex was about this level of agility that we need as leaders, but also, as I said at the outset, to start thinking about everyone in your, in your team and in your organization as a potential leader. So if you take that to the next level, then it's a question of what are all the leaders in us going to do in the world? And I think the next uh, focus for me is to, in some ways, reinvent what it means to be a leader, because we need to start to tackle the bigger problems. We live on a very small planet that's in a very difficult place. And if all we do is keep focusing on short-term profits and you know the success of our one little company based in New York or Idaho or wherever you are, you're going to miss the big picture, which is that the planet is dying and that we are part of an ecosystem. You know, you may live in a small community, but your community is interconnected and interwoven with the entire planet. So as leaders, we have to create connectivity to the bigger issues. We have to solve the big problems and that we have to recognize that those big problems are right in front of us. They're not across the ocean. They're in our space. We live in those problems. So I really want leaders to start to think of themselves from a systemic sort of ecosystem perspective. And uh, so I'm digging into the research. There's a, lot, there's a lot of folks like that are doing good research around systemic thinking, uh, regenerative mindset. Um, and I wanna start to really push the edge around what it means to be a leader in today's world, because we have to solve really complex problems, not just make money. <laughs> not that making money is a bad thing, but we have, we have to do more than that. I wish you much luck on uh, getting, getting that heart, you know, passion project uh, with, <laughs> with you. your, with your book deal. That's fantastic. Jeffrey, I, um, I just want to open it up. Is there anything that I didn't think to ask you that would, you know, that you'd like to kind of add in, in the last minute we have here on the show? Um, no, we covered a lot of territory and uh, I think it, it's been great. I guess the only thing that I would um, want to add, I think, to the idea about thinking about your team from the standpoint of having everyone step into their leadership is 
you know, for those of us that are uh, Caucasian in today's world um, and in America and in Western culture, it's really important that we be on a learning journey to understand and to have empathy and to have a deeper understanding, a deeper respect and a deeper sensitivity to there's so many different ways to see the world. And, you know, I work with a lot of multicultural teams. I work with leaders of color from all over the world. And I just think it's really important that as we step into um, nurturing leadership in everyone, that we really pay attention to being curious and being learners and not necessarily coming to our leadership roles with the mindset that, you know, just because we come from America or just because we are brought up in the Western culture that we have all the answers. We can learn so much if we put on our curiosity hats and uh, really lean into listening to people from other nationalities, people of other countries, people from other cultures. Um, it's also gonna take us to another place of connectivity and recognizing that we live on a very small planet. Yeah, I, um, I think that that is an excellent point and curiosity I think is um, the world's solution to almost everything. If we just approach it with, you know, like, I'm curious, help me understand that. And, you know, yeah. tell me more. And um, it's a very, very powerful um, magic, I think. It's magical. I totally agree. The elixir that will help us get through all the things that we need to get through uh, for, sure. for humanity. Yeah, that's awesome. Jeffrey, thank you so much. I, um, I very much appreciate you sharing your time with us today. That was my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Fantastic. For all of you listeners out there, um, I hope that you've enjoyed today's episode. If you've had an aha moment, I hope that you will share that with us in the comments below. And just know that um, I am here to assist you if I can help you in any way. You, um, you can hop on to deliberatedirections.com and um, select a, a time for a strategy session. And I, I welcome that. So Jeffrey, again, thank you so much. And you folks have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.